next. Okay. Just a little bit behind schedule today. One minute. Come on in. For those of you checking the replay, you can fast forward right ahead a few minutes. We wait for people to come in here for the live. So if you're on the replay, just fast forward a little bit. You'll get to that. Just getting the invites out. And we usually get started usually around 2.04 or so. So let's see here. Channel, confirm we're good and live. Yes, we are. Cool. Get the slideshow up. Come on in, come on in. Share the invite. Let people know that we're here so we can get the show started right away. You know the drill. I'm going to copy the seeing the live chat. You guys can put your QA in there. I'm going to post and pin to the top the presentation slides. That's done. Good. Okay. Get folks in here. Again, if you're just joining in and you're new, we're going to get started in just a couple of minutes. We let people come in here. We usually have 40 or 50 people before we get started, so we're going to get started in about two minutes. As long as everybody shares the live and gets everybody in here, we're going to be good. Yeah, Rebecca, what a week, right? Absolutely. We're going to talk about it. Hey, no big surprise, right? I've been talk I've been talking about this for a long time. Uh, yellow alert. It's hard to believe it's been almost two years that we've been in a flat to down market, but here we are, right? That's that's my job to help you all understand what's going to happen um, and, and, and what is happening regardless of how long it lasts. I mean, this is this has been crazy, but it's not unprecedented. Usually when something this happened, something like this happens, it does go on for a couple of years, two or three years is what it takes. So um, one more message out there. Get people in here. The numbers are racking up quick, so we are going to get started real soon, hopefully, as long as you guys are sharing that live. Uh, let's see, live now. And the link so we can start. We got a lot to talk about to, today, by the way. This is going to be something else. Um, this is going to be a, a heck of a show. Uh, let's see. Talk Live is now. We got one person. And actually, you know, uh, so the person texting me right now is actually texting about um, the Money Mark app. So while we're at it, while we're just about to get started, um, those of you that are new to me or those of you who don't have this app yet is now out on Android and iOS in the U.S. only, I believe. You can check in your country. It might be available. But it's Money Mark, one word, and then official is the other word. So it's two words, Money Mark and official. That's an app. It's a free app. will always be free. And if you're new, the first thing you want to click on is for the beginner, which is actually the last thing in the, in the menu, right? But this is your portal. It'll give you access to my YouTube, my Twitter, my easy money portfolio, my complete pick history. And um, the last, the four of the beginner actually takes you to my blog site. So you get all a access to everything I do, which is all for free, all in one place. So get that start started up. And let's see, we'll go back to the slideshow here. Um, until four. Uh, okay. I'm live now. All right. Uh, we're only up to 30. You guys gotta share the gotta share the live, or we won't get a, a show. You know what I you know what I do. You guys don't do your part. I don't do mine. This is all for free. I'm retired. I can go to the beach. Okay. Share the invite. You can hit the hit the reshare button on StockTwits. You hit the um, retweet button on Twitter. 
get people in here. This is the only thing I ask y'all to do. Now the numbers are starting to kick up. Don't be lazy out there. If you're listening to my voice right now and you haven't invited somebody to this show, you're not doing the one thing I'm asking you to do, which is to help get the word out, okay? And you should feel ashamed of yourself getting all this for free. We've been killing the market, okay? Yes, we have ups and downs. Yes, we have winners and losers. But you're, if you have been watching and following my rules, you are not down 25% like everybody else. You are not down 15% like the Russell is in the last six weeks. In fact, you are up 16% because we shorted the Russell at those highs. And we're going to look at those charts and a lot more charts, but you got to do your part or I'm going to go off to the beach, okay? Get those numbers up. We're look, you know what I look for on this. And for all you newbies out there, I apologize. Try to be a little bit of patient, you know, and you're going to catch on to the drill on why it's worth it to share this live with folks and get the numbers out there because we do have now over 2,000 followers, over 100,000 views. We get over 1,000 views a week, and there's a reason for that. And part of it is because you guys help me to share this. I do all that work, and all you have to do is share it. That's it, okay? So, um, there we go. Now we over 40. I don't want to have to pull teeth from now on. Watch. You know what's going to happen next week? We're going to get started in just a second, but I'm going to let you know. Next week, I'm not going to give any invites. I'm not going to share the link. I'm not going to do any of that stuff, and I'm going to see if we get to 40. And if we don't, I'm not doing the show. It's simple as that. You guys have to do your part. I don't want to have to pull teeth for this. If you don't like the show, don't tune in, Okay. It's as simple as that. That's how I know that you guys are paying your dues. I don't ask for money. I ask for you guys to help out in sharing the live. And if you don't do that part, I'm going to know it. Because all I have to do is not share the live, and then I'll know if you are based on these numbers coming in. Okay? So that's my... And by the way, guys, anybody that's new to my show, this is how I talk. Okay? Because this is how professionalism is done. This is how business is done. And business is how we get rich. So we're going to get on that, okay? It's not this fluffy stuff. There's some real hardcore work that gets done to get rich. If you want a penthouse like I have right now in Miami Beach, hung out, you know, hanging out with some of these guys like Jamie Dimon, Mark Cuban, who have units in this building right next to mine, you want that life, then you have to do a little bit of work behind it, okay? So let's get to it. Number one, all right? Especially for you guys that didn't share the live and all that. Let's get this out of the way on your mobile device. There is live chat. You can put your questions in there. Put a question mark at the end of your question because there are a lot of comments that come into the chat. I try to only pay attention to the questions so we'll get through the content as quickly as possible. We've got a lot of good stuff to talk about today. But before we do, hit the X on the side of your phone right here and it will reveal your thumbs up button. Hit that thumbs up button, okay? There's 58 of you live. There should be 58 thumbs up, and that's the only other thing I'm going to ask you to do today. So hit that thumbs up now. I'm going to check to see if y'all have done it, and then we're going to get going here, okay? That's it. And that's all I ask for. Share the live. Hit the thumbs up button. How hard is that, right? Not hard at all for what you get. And again, for those who don't know, my name is Money Mark. <clears throat> I am a retired Wall Street consultant. I had customers like Jim Cramer. In fact, Jim, uh, multiple Jim Kramer firms, Kramer and Company, Kramer Berkowitz, customers of mine throughout my career. I retired back in 2009, and since that time, for almost all of that time since 2009, I've been providing my content for free, things that I would sell out for, uh, it was a seven-figure business per year, okay? Now I do it for free. It's less like work because it's only a few hours a week, but it is for free, and it is donated to you instead of to Wall Street, all right? And that's all That's all I got to say about that. Now, let's get into today's content. Just going to double check to see if we got the thumbs up that we were looking for. Yes, we do. We get, Most of y'all did it. Those who didn't, shame on you, but we're starting the show for the rest of y'all that did. All right, cool. Enough of that. The following is not a solicitation to buy, sell, or otherwise transact any stock or derivatives, nor should it be construed as an endorsement of any particular investment or opinion of a stock's current or future price. To be clear, I do not encourage or recommend for anyone to follow my lead on any investment style or instruments, as I may enter, exit, or reverse a position at any time without notice, advance or otherwise, regardless of the facts or perceived implication of this content. I am not a registered financial advisor. I'm a former Wall Street consultant. 
I'm not providing recommendations, price targets, etc., etc. Suffice it to say, if you are watching this, then you acknowledge that you have read all of these disclosures and that this content is for informational, educational, and entertainment purposes only. All right. Boom. Let's get right to the charts. All right. Um, hey, look at that. I mean, we went on yellow alert way back here. Okay. And the market did nothing but give us a little bit of head fake since that time. I mean, I almost called the exact top of the market back here in 2021. Since that time, I have not swayed off of that. Okay. The market bounced. I didn't sway. The market bounced hard. That was tough. Let's zoom in on this. Okay. We had a crazy period right here from mid-June to mid-August, two full months where the market rallied really hard and people thought we might have been out of this bear market. Not me, okay? The data did not suggest it. The professional information analysis did not validate what people were thinking might be going on. And for those of you who are new to this show, okay, I will tell you as a matter of fact, all right, one of my friends... Right, close friend of mine um, was chatting with uh, one of the Nigerian brothers, right, and who validated while they're on TV, what they tell you is what you want to hear to keep you watching the TV screen. Okay, so a few weeks ago when the market was ripping higher, everybody wanted to hear that hopium. Everybody wanted to hear that good news why the market's going up. This is great. Maybe this is a new bull market. And that's what they told you on the TV screen. Why? Because CNBC's business is to sell advertising, not to make you rich. That is not Jim Cramer's mission. It's not to make you rich. It's to keep your eyeballs on the screen because it sells advertising because that's how they make money. Jim Cramer doesn't make any money if you get rich. He gets rich if you watch his show. Okay? And so they will say anything they have to to keep you watching the show. And so that's why when you look at Jim Cramer's track record, just Google it. He has a terrible track record of being right on CNBC. But he has a great track record of keeping people watching his show. Okay? So they were telling you what you wanted to hear back here when the market was ripping. But behind the scenes, my buddy told me, he's hanging out with one of the Nigerians. And he's saying, we're really worried. On the TV screen, we've got our smiles on. But off the TV screen, we're all looking at each other like, this is, this is not good what's going on, okay? And that's just confirmation of what I've been telling you all along, that what's going on is not good. And since that time, I warned you, all right, I told you to stick to the rules of the yellow alert. And when we get to these high levels, we almost hit that white line, okay? And I'm not about white lines for you newbies. You're veterans, you know this already. You newbies, I'll explain to you maybe a little bit later in the show. But these white lines are just technical. They help to guide the way a little bit and show us what's happened. And up near these levels, it was, no, we need to take profits where we've gotten great profits. And we need to also put on more shorts because this market should roll over based on the professional analysis that I've done for you. And that's exactly what happened. And since that time, the Russell is down Check it out. You could see on the box right over my head, over the last six weeks, the market's down 16%. The Russell is down 16%. The S&P is only down about 6.5%. The reason that we short the Russell, the reason we buy IWM, and I'll zoom in here for y'all so you see exactly what's happened over the last few weeks. Okay, and the Russell, there it is, this big collapse in Russell action. All right, and what was I saying? If you don't know how to short, then you can buy RWM, which will do it for you. And let's see what RWM has done. Boom. Big move up. Okay? You made a crazy profit. If you hit if you if you nailed the bottom on that, you're up 16% while everybody else is losing their ass. Okay? So it's as simple as that. All right, let's go back to the charts and, and enough explanation. Here's what's going on next. Number one, <clears throat> if you missed that. Okay, you know the rules. I come out here, I talk about them on a weekly basis. I provide it in the For the Beginner section of my of the Money Mark app. The blog site, all right, I'll show you the blog site in a second in case you can't download the app so you know how to get to that. We are getting towards the lower end of this range, 
okay? That does not mean I get bullish. No, because we could crash right down through this range and be down here at any time based on what's going on out there. Do I think there's a very good chance we could bounce? Yes, but I'm not a trader. I'm an investor. I got rich being an investor. Warren Buffett got rich being an investor. You cannot name one of the top 20 richest people in the world that are traders. Warren Buffett has publicly said he does not know one rich person that's a trader. Not one. Not one single rich trader he knows. Okay. Now, obviously, there are rich traders, but they're rare. They're hard to find. One out of 20 people have what it takes to be a great trader. And if you're one of them, I applaud you. I'm not. I've already been tested for it. It doesn't work for me. Okay. Um, but almost anybody can be a successful investor. Okay. And you just need to follow the rules. And that's the hardest part. Knowing the rules, easy. Following the rules is tough because it doesn't feel natural. It doesn't feel fun. It doesn't feel good. But you know what feels good? getting that money, getting that money. And that's what we're here to do. Okay. So what happens next? If you missed the boat last time on shorting the market up here because you were afraid we were going into a new bull market because you were afraid money mark might be wrong. I'm sorry. You missed it. You cannot jump in now and get short now. That is what a lot of people are feeling like doing right now is getting short now. Right. But guess what? Everybody already knows what's going on. Nobody knew what was going to make the market crash back here. I didn't. I did not know what was going to cause the Russell to drop 16% six weeks ago. But I knew something would. That's what I keep telling you. You never know what the catalyst is going to be. Because once everybody knows what the catalyst is, then there's no surprise. There's no catalyst. It's already known. And of course now it's already known that there's a banking crisis out there. And the market has responded to that. Has it responded all the way? I don't know. I made money by jumping in before it happened, knowing that something was going to happen. There, and by the way, there's going to be another domino to drop. Okay, I'm not going to give you any more lecture about what happened in the past and what you've missed out on. Let's talk about what's in the future. And the future is things are going to get worse. There are going to be more dominoes to drop. What's going to drop next? I don't know. Just like every week, I'm going to tell you. I don't know, but I do know another domino is going to drop. It could be student loans, okay, because there's been a moratorium on mortgages, student loans, other types of loan payments because of COVID. COVID, it was COVID-19. It's 2023. It's time for those moratoriums to come off. And that's not my opinion. That's an actual fact. The moratoriums are coming off and people are now going to have to start paying those things again. And that's a problem because the average American, maybe not you, definitely not me, but the average American, 68% of all Americans live paycheck to paycheck, okay? And what they've done over the last couple of years is they've gotten used to spending 100% of that money, but many of them have not been paying their mortgage because of the moratoriums. Many of them have not been paying student loans because of the moratoriums. Well, those moratoriums are now ending. And I hear, I didn't have enough time to do the research before this show, um, I hear that a lot of those moratoriums ending also include having to pay back that extra mortgage payments that you didn't make during the moratorium. That's not going to happen. A lot of people can't do that. A lot of people can't even just start doing their mortgage payments again because they've been living paycheck to paycheck. They got used to living at a higher standard because they didn't have to pay, make their mortgage payment. So they're still spending all their money, but now they got to make a mortgage payment with the same money they make every week. And some of those people are losing their jobs. I have friends losing their jobs. I don't know about you, but I'm hearing an increasing frequency. It doesn't show up in the unemployment data yet. We could talk about why. If you want to hear why, you can ask the question. Otherwise, I'll assume you don't care. But just trust me, the unemployment data doesn't show the underlying weakness in the employment market. And there's a good reason for that. And what happens is... The market always crashes right after unemployment looks super, super healthy. It, you got a peak in healthy unemployment levels, and then it crashes every single time. Okay? doesn't seem intuitive, but that's what happens. Now, um, <clears throat> what are we going to talk about this week? We've got uh, some stocks. For those of you, look what's happened. I mean, monster moves. We have monster moves in, in some of our names. Okay? Um, we're going to talk about this one. We're going to talk about this one. Uh, this one still has a D on the 
sharp, but it, it's actually back to TPCS. We're going to talk about this one. Uh, we're going to talk about a bunch of stocks, and we are going to have Chartorama. We've got a whole bunch of charts for y'all to see, and I'm going to answer your Q&A today. So don't go anywhere because we got a lot to talk about. But that's the uh, a lot of the macro. Uh, let me see now. What I'm going to do is we're going to have a, a macro guest shortly. Let me see. And I'm just inviting him now. And then we're going to pipe him in, all right? Um, all the way from Romania. He manages money in Romania. He's one of the people that I turn to. He's very good at, unlike me, he's good at kind of calling turns in the market. So he does some of the trading stuff as well as macro stuff. So we're going to have him as a guest on the show in just a few minutes. And then we're also going to have a guest who is in my opinion, the number one expert on this stock right here, PESI, my latest pick, okay? So even though it is my latest official pick, I am not the smartest guy on this stock, in my opinion. I'm going to bring that smartest guy on this stock onto the show in about 25 minutes. But first, let me get our first guest on the show. Hello, Mark. Andre, how you doing? Fine. How are you? Fantastic. If you don't mind speaking up just a little bit for the for the folks at home, uh, you sound pretty good sure. to me. But just a little bit might help sure. out. Uh, those of you at home, uh, let me know if you hear Andre okay. Uh, how's it going, Andre? Pretty good. Pretty good. Surviving current market. Pretty hard, to be honest with you. A lot of things happening in a very short time frame. Yeah. But, uh, that's the market. We have to adapt to it, right? Absolutely. Well, I mean, I, I don't know about you, but you've been helping me make money and helping me save money. I mean, it, it's obviously very difficult to make the kind of returns that we're used to. I know during, you know, yeah. from 2018 to 2021, we had a four-year four period where um, my picks averaged 85% annualized. That's not happening right now, right? But to... Yeah. Go. Right now is the general market, which doesn't mm -hmm. help your picks. Your picks are great, but the problem is the general market doesn't help it. Right, it drags it down. It's and very hard, yeah. Exactly, and that and that's why our hedges are helping us to not lose money, even though our favorite companies are still making progress. So what's great about this, in my opinion, is that you know the chart that's on the screen right now, you don't see it, but um, Permafix, PESI, that's a stock that got down to three bucks, partly because of the market environment, and it's just tripled in the last um, month and a half because their fundamentals are good. And eventually, if you're dealing with companies with great fundamentals, it's eventually going to pay off. Now, in this environment, and I'm sure you'll be able to tell us about this, there are very few companies that are well positioned to prosper in a recession, which I believe is coming. And that's my first question to you. Do you believe a rest recession is coming? What do you see out there? What are you doing right now? Because the markets just dropped. The, the Russell just dropped 16% in a month. Um, you know, what do you think? Well, about the recession, first of all, uh, I'm not sure if we are already in a recession or not. It's not an if, but a when. Yep. Regarding the recession. Okay. Uh, what I did right now, to be honest with you, today after the open, uh, I've closed my uh, tactical uh, short. Okay. In the sense that uh, the, the hedges for the general portfolios are still left in place because, as you, as your uh, audience know, it's yellow or red, but uh, yellow alert from my side. It's actually an orange alert, to be honest. Okay, so you're on uh, you're on orange yeah, alert. Yeah. You're on orange alert, okay? But you said you covered your tactical hedges. So in other words, you you are protecting your main portfolio with some hedges, but then you also yes. put trades on when you think you can make money from the market going down, exactly. and you call that tactical. Exactly. Okay, yes. and you... I did at the 40, 50, S&P 500. That okay. was two weeks ago or so. Two weeks ago. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me catch up to you a little bit here. So two weeks ago, one or two weeks ago, something like this, it was yes. And what what was the S and P at? It, it was something around forty fifty. For around forty fifty, I got you on the chart right now. Yeah. Got you right here. And oh man, so you really did well because we're down to thirty nine fifty. Yeah, what, what I did to, to be to be more precise, what I did, I covered the thirty eight hundred because there's a mass put wall. Okay. I also look at options positioning. Okay. Right. 
And uh, when we were at 3800 for SAP, VIX was at 30, and VIX has a massive call wall, which acts as a resistance. Okay. And when both of them were, S&P was at resistance from options, from support from options, and VIX was at, uh, was at resistance, being a 30, it was an obvious cover for short. Okay. At least for tactical trades. Got you. Then we had, we had the spike uh, from Monday, when I was also telling to the guys on the group that VIX was at 19, market was under hedge, it was coming, we had the FOMC on Wednesday, right? Mm-hmm. From my side, it was obvious we were going to get 25 basis points, and I had I highly doubt that the quantitative tightening was going to end, mm-hmm. which we got a confirmation is not going to end. And right. that is the most important bit, in my opinion, from that FOMC, because right. the current uh, uh, the current market stress on the banking sector it's not only from the interest rate; it's also from the drain of liquidity through quantitative tightening. Right. Right. Yeah, and and on and on top of that, and on top of that, we have Janet Yellen, who because of the uh, the debt ceiling debate that's coming up, uh, she had to drain uh, capital. She she threw liquidity into the system from the treasury. Yeah, from the TGA, and uh, that find a way through the system. That's right. Why we had in the first part of the year, January and February, up from what thirty eight, thirty nine hundred to almost forty two hundred S and P. It was insane. And that was because of li- that was because of liquidity, not because exactly. of, not because exactly. of fund not because of fundamentals, no. but because of no. money no. flowing in purely because of money flowing into the system from the government. Yeah, and you can you the easiest way to spot liquidity when a rally is driven by liquidity is to watch Bitcoin. When you see Bitcoin rallying, because algos are most of them are set to uh, to buy cryptos and Bitcoin. When they oh. see an increase in liquidity, liquidity can, can come from three sides, TGA, RRP, and Fed balance sheet. That's why you saw Bitcoin rallying this week against the German market dropping because Algo saw an increase in the federal balance sheet, the 300 or so uh, billions, or millions, right? Billions. Because, because they tried to, to save the banking sector. Right, right, right. Ah, seeing you taught me something I didn't know before. So that's why we yes. that's why we see Bitcoin take off. It's because the exactly. algos are buyers on the liquidity. Exactly. But the algos, what they don't know is that those money are not going to stimulate the economy. Right. Because banks are they, they're using that liquidity that they ha- they have through the swaps that Fed provides now and the Treasury provides now. They use it just to meet the need for cash to give the depositors their money back, not to create new new loans. Which in turn stimulate economy, right? Right. So that liquidity is not going to stimulate the economy and go through the system. It's only paper money to meet uh, to meet the demand from depositors to give them the their money back. Crazy. Because I saw a lot of people saying that uh, the new increase in the balance sheet, mm-hmm. uh, it's it, it's sort of quantitative easing. It's not at all. It's far from that. Okay. They didn't understand how this works. Okay. Now, hold on one second. For those of you at home, if your head is spinning right now over what he's talking about, there's a good reason for that. Okay. This guy knows what he's talking about. It's very detailed. It's very, and this is part of the reason why the average mom and pop investor gets ripped off by the fat cats is that the fat cats and the algos, they know a lot of this stuff that Andre here is sharing. Andre knows about it. I don't know a lot of this stuff, and that's why I pay attention to what he says in my WhatsApp room, and I'm going to give you guys the opportunity to join those WhatsApp rooms. Again, all for free. Everything I do is for free. Andre's here for free out of the goodness of his heart and providing this information, but the bottom line is, what you have to know is, the stock market doesn't act on the basis of pure fundamentals in real time. Because of money that gets injected into the system. So liquidity can either um, help the market go stay up, go up faster, or when it reverses, hold it down or push it down faster. So liquidity is one of the major things that you want to look for. There's earnings trajectory, you know, uh, growth in the economy, uh, inflation, and liquidity are three of the major things that you want to really look for 
and, and liquidity is the, the one that a lot of people overlook and don't understand. And Andre is one person that I really lean on the most when it comes to understanding where we are in parts of that cycle. Now, Andre, before I let you go, um, yo, is there anything else you want to share? Number one, but number two, tell the folks at home anything you want to let them know about yourself. Uh, cause you know, I, I, you really deserve some recognition for everything that you do for us. Thank you very much. So, uh, I would briefly just tell you that I don't believe the current, um, fiscal policy is sustainable. In my opinion, it's not sustainable. I believe we will see only at maximum another rate, rate hike. I think, uh, I think we already see cracks in the banking sector, and I think these cracks are only the beginning. Uh, I believe the current situation is very similar to the bear stars in 2008, right? Everybody right now went into tech believing that all oh, lower yields is bullish for tech. Uh, that's what what they, uh, they thought in uh, 08 after the bear stars fallout, and just a few months after that, uh, Nasdaq dropped something like 50% in a few months. So, uh, speaking of the underlying economy, uh, I don't know if it's all your audience. I think you already did, but uh, you, myself, we are having friends who are losing their jobs. Yeah, right? I did. Yeah, uh, unfortunately, unemployment numbers are very lagging. So, it will take some time before the Fed realizes this. But uh, we currently have the lowest savings rate since 2008. We have a credit card spending at record, like an average interest rate of 20.8% per fret for mm -hmm. April. Mm -hmm. To me, these things doesn't sound like uh, there's a sustainable path to high interest rate. No, and, 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 and right. And so what's really incredible is that in the last couple of weeks, we've had big injections of liquidity and still the market has been going down. So yeah. that exactly. I, that is incredibly bearish that when even heavy injections of liquidity cannot stop the market from going down. So what happens when that either runs out or runs out of steam? Because, you know, of course, to keep something moving or keep something afloat, it requires more and more effort. So even if they maintain the same level of liquidity, it's going to have a diminished effect. Yeah. And uh, all the liquidity that uh, we had from COVID, yep. it's going to run out according to Goldman Sachs uh, somewhere around summer, June, July, something like this, when people will really run out of money. That's going to be a disaster. And that is when the panic sets in. Right. Well, listen, not for nothing, but you know, there is still excess uh, savings out there in the general economy, but a large, yes. per a large percentage of Americans have already run out of their money. Right. As a as a country, as a country, we still have excess savings out there. But most of the excess savings is on is in the hands of people like me. And and I, I need a new car, but I'm not going to buy it right now because I know in six months I can get it cheaper. doesn't matter that I'm rich. <coughs> Excuse me. Yeah, I, I just know a discussion uh, last night with one of the biggest uh, real estate developers in Romania. And uh, he was telling me he was going to build a 2,000 apartments mm -hmm. uh, complex. And uh, they had all the permits last week. Okay. But unfortunately, because of everything that happened recently in the last two weeks, they had to stop everything. Yeah, that's crazy. And, and, and they, were, they, were, they didn't get credit for that. They were building on their own uh, money. Right. Right? So it wasn't a, a problem of lending. They just realized... There's not going to be demand out there when they will be finished. Right, and so and we are talking about some very big and smart guys. Right, and so what I've what I've put on my screen right now is is a ticker symbol APOG, and that's one of the stocks that I'm short. They make glass primarily. They make glass for skyscrapers. So mm -hmm. with what's happening in the office commercial uh, building sector and what you're seeing there, that's, that's the next sector to fall. <laughs> commercial real estate. It's literally the next one. We which is falling as we speak. <laughs> yeah, and, 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 and right, and and I I'll say I don't know what the next domino is to fall. Just before I brought you on, I said I don't know what the next domino to fall is going to be, but there is going to be a next domino. Your guess is the commercial uh, real estate sector. Your yeah. guess is as good as mine. I'll still say I don't know, but we'll see if you're right about that. Um, Andre, <laughs> anything anything you want to tell them about yourself before I let you go? Well, uh, I'm just building right now a new business. It's called X Capital Consulting. Uh, our aim is to bring private wealth management closer to the retail. Okay. Retail meaning in the, 
uh, people with over $500,000 of asset under management. Our emphasis will be on education, educate the client, you know, make it under, uh, make the client understand how institutional investors think okay. and which is the correct approach proven, as you said, by uh, Warren Buffett, uh, Gunlack and all of these stars. Uh, we will later also have some courses for those who are interested, but right now our focus is uh, on uh, helping the customers which have already contacted us, and uh, we're trying to help everybody. <laughs> how, how can how can they try to navigate this market? We also we also have a newsletter. Okay. For those who are more keen to uh, build their own portfolios. So Andre, how can we spoke? To, yeah. How can they find you? Uh, I will let you know when our website is ready. Okay, <laughs> great. It, uh, as we speak. All right, we have we have one question in the queue. They said, Andre, is there any good news? Yes. Is there any good news? Actually, have some good news. Uh, short term, uh, I don't believe that we're going to see a flash crash. <laughs> okay. And this is because of positioning and sentiment. Right, right. Well, yeah, and, and, and definitely we just had a big move down, so it, it decreases the chances that we're going to see a further move down quickly here. Um, you know, and, and traders may want to trade that, and, you know, you cover your tactical shorts. I don't generally put on tactical shorts. I have nothing to cover. I guess if you at home have tactical shorts, you could cover those and give yourselves a, a round of applause for making that quick, easy money. As for me, I'm just protecting my long positions. I'm going to continue to protect my long positions here at these levels. Um, but of course, having made a lot of money on those shorts over the last few weeks, I have to make sure that my portfolio is balanced to where my shorts and my longs are equal um, because things a lot has changed over the last few weeks where they were equal a few weeks ago, but now my RWM has gone up in value. Some of my stocks have gone down in value, of course, with the market, and now I have to probably sell some RWM at these levels to balance those things out. Andre, I want to thank you very much for, uh, for, for joining us today. I'm going to let you go because I have to talk about a few things before our next guest, but definitely let me know as soon as you have information about your service and we'll tune you in. Of course. Thank you very much, Mark. All right. Take care. Take care. Take care. Bye. Bye. -bye. Hey, Aaron, we're live. Uh, are, are you are you good to be live? Yeah, whenever you are. Oh, geez. You know, I, we thought you were going to come on in a few more minutes, but, you know, I was just saying um, goodbye to our last guest. Ladies and gentlemen, I, hey, we're going right back, back to back. We have Aaron Warwick on the call. He's definitely the star of the day because, as you see today, um, uh, Permafix, which is up 10% today, uh, he came on last week. So what's, what's last week? Last week was the 17th. We can zoom in on the chart, and you can see here that this stock has gone up quite a bit, 19% in one week since you were here last week, Aaron. Um, congratulations. It was a, a great earnings call for Permafix. Um, you, know, this, you know, this is my latest pick. But it wouldn't be if not for you and all the information you provided that, that I was able to validate and say, you know what, this, this guy knows what he's talking about. This is a great stock. And, and, and this pick, um, I think, is up well over 20% um, since I picked it a, a couple of weeks ago. So, number one, first and foremost, let me thank you for that. Uh, and, and second, um, you know, what, what do you think? Oh, yeah, March... March 10th is when I initiated, and we're up 24%. So thank you for that 24% gain. Um, what do you say, brother? Yeah, I think it's just getting started. Um, we can talk about why I think that. I mean, obviously, it's been a good return. It's tripled since uh, the 52-week lows. Right. Uh, but that, that was due to numerous reasons that we don't even need to get into, I don't think, today. But I think the more important thing is, you know, what the future is. Okay, and and what do you think of that? What did, what did we get from the call that adds to what you did, what you said last week? Yeah, a couple of things. So uh, I break it out into three categories. I had a Substack post about this this morning, and, and um, people can read that if they wish. Uh, it's the Breakout Investors Substack page. Uh, but going into a little more detail here, so I, I really want to break it out into three different areas. We can start with their core business. Uh, is the first area. The second area would be Hanford, secondary waste. We learned some new things there that were extremely bullish. And then uh, the rest of Hanford, the, the TBI, Testbed Initiative, and ITBC, which is the big, massive $45 billion contract. So I, I would start with what we learned about the core business. As I expected, you know, the fourth quarter was really weak. 
uh, compared to what what you know what should be going forward. Uh, it was even a little yeah. bit weaker than I expected, just because they ran ran into some labor issues that have now been resolved. Yeah, I thought uh, but, I thought I thought the quarter was fine myself. Like I I didn't have any. There were no expectations for the quarter because everything's about what's happening now with Hanford and the big EPS yeah. that they can generate from that. Yeah, but and, and what I want to highlight is that. Uh, Part of Hanford, the secondary waste, I would now classify, start classifying it going forward as part of their core business. But their, you know, if we want to call it legacy core business, that's going to be profitable. They indicated at least by the second quarter. It, they, they may be at break even or positive in the first quarter, but they indicated they'll be well into the black uh, by the second quarter because they've had a lot of treatment backlog coming in. They've got a lot of service contracts that have been moving forward. So we're really starting to see the, the change from that COVID lag that they had uh, is now picking up, and, and they should be back to a significant growth trajectory, even without considering Hanford. Okay. And and just for those of you at home, um, stay tuned. We are going to talk about Infu Systems, Smith Micro, TPCS. We've got a lot more to discuss, so stay tuned. We're just going to get through this permafix information and then go to your Q&A and Chartorama. So um, back to you, Aaron. You know, what do you think the biggest surprises were for you relative to uh, what you expected going into the call as far as the, the forward guidance? Yeah, so uh, how profitable, I mean, how confident they were in profitability was one surprise. I mean, I figured they'd be profitable. They sounded like they'd you know, be making a nice profit. That's number one. Number two, uh, and these the two and three are even bigger, more important for me. Uh, I had indicated, told people to expect maybe 40 million to 50 million dollars in revenue from the secondary waste uh we'll just call it a contract it's not technically a contract but they talked about on the call it's official document and essentially as good as a contract for them to treat the secondary waste coming from the handfoot plant that'll start up sometime late in 24 where they'll start treating it they'll probably have a full year in 25 uh but what so i said 40 to 50 million was my best estimate they said on the call, 65 to 75 million in revenue per year from that at high margins. And they were asked by uh, Howard Rouse on the call, uh, the first questioner said that, sorry, his back of the envelope numbers were about $3 of earnings per share coming from uh, just treating that secondary. $3. Yeah. My screen has and, and, two. And when? Know, what, $10 today. So. Yeah, $3 a share, and, and they confirmed I've got, they, they, a couple of times, actually. I, I kind of uh, probed a little bit deeper about it when I got a chance to ask questions, and they sort of actually were even more firm than the CFO came on and, and said, yeah, you know, that's, that's an accurate depiction of what we're expecting. Okay, so I was looking at $2 at full ramp, which is expected to be like you know late 2024. You're saying $3. What's the time frame for that? Well, the time frame to get that, I don't think you're going to see it full scale until 2025. I'm getting okay. a full year of it. Okay. But we're, but we're talking about the minimum, minimum, the, con, the uh, document stated 10 years uh, on the timeline. However, there's a probability, a good probability uh, that, and the reason it said 10 years is the DOE is thinking that eventually they'll build a, a place on site for the DOE to run to treat the secondary waste. Uh, there's a lot of skepticism around whether the DOE will ever actually do that. And so what that would mean, if the it means it's a minimum 10 years, it could be 50 to 80 years because that's how long they're, they're planning to run this plant at Hanford. And so if they don't build something on site to treat the secondary waste, uh, then that's going to continue to be shipped, I'm, I'm guessing, all of those decades to Permafix. So quite an annuity they have, a uh, minimum 10 years. Yeah, I mean, so this this explains why the stock's acting the way it is because the way that my chart is is drawn right now, you know, I have a, a twenty dollar target on the stock for uh, middle of next year, so that's a that's a great return even from right these levels. But if, if they're going to be going from two dollars of EPS run rate in twenty four to three dollars of EPS run rate in twenty five, then then my lines are are too conservative. These lines have to be pushed yeah. up. That's, that's just on that project, but they should bring at least a dollar per share on other business. Plus, we'll talk about here in a minute, I'm sure, the other opportunities that they'll buy then at Hanford. So that's that's just on, on secondary waste. If you, if you include their other business, just their core business right now, I'd expect to add at least another dollar per share to that. Wow. 
Yeah, so that so basically there's a lot of ways to win. Right, right. So, um all right, so why why don't you give why don't you give us the right one more takeaway from the call? Sure. So uh the other takeaway was the ITDC, which is the contract to oversee the Hanford position, uh, Hanford plan. And that would not is a forty five billion dollar estimated forty five dollar contract. Now to be very clear, that's not all going to perfect fix. Okay, perfect fix will be a relatively small player in that. But there are two uh, bidding conglomerates in, in that uh, vying for that contract. And that's expected to come out uh, I, I just heard today the state representatives heard it would be momentarily, whatever that means to the DOE. It's it's been widely expected the end of the first quarter or sometime in the beginning of the second quarter that it's going to be announced. It, it, essentially has to be announced before third quarter because the third quarter is when this thing would start up and when the current contract to oversee the the buildup of the Hanford plant will be running out. So uh, what surprised me is that obviously if Permafix's group, again, one of two groups, if they win that contract, obviously Permafix is going to benefit significantly. What was new to me was the notion that even if Permafix's group loses, mm-hmm. they still might get business under that contract. And the reason is, uh, under the request for proposal that the DOE put out several years ago for this project, to oversee this project, uh, they stipulated that roughly, this, according to the CEO, I have a little bit higher. I think he was being conservative. But roughly 200, I had a $225 million. So we'll just, But we'll just say $200 million has to be awarded on an annualized basis to a small business and Permafix is classified under these government rules as a small business. And I asked on the call, I mean, I knew the answer, but I just wanted to get it out of the public domain. Uh, there, I said, you know, how many small businesses are there that do this type of stuff that you do and will be able to oversee that? And, and his answer was, well, you know, our competitors are not small businesses and there are very few, if any others that could, that could do this, certainly none of them are anywhere near close to the Hanford facility like they are. They're 15 miles away. Right, and, and that, so, that's uh, important to note, yeah. right, because they really put them, they made an investment to yeah. position themselves here, even putting in their own proprietary uh, rail line, right, so that there's really nobody else that makes sense for this logistically. Right, and so even if they, even if their group loses that Track because of the small business stipulation, it's still possible that they're going to see significant revenue uh, coming in f- from the operation of that plant just because of the fact that they're a small business. Got you, got you. So, listen, Aaron, what I what I want to do at this point, um, you know, tell us a little bit about Breakout Investors. I want to send them there for more information. Um, you know, I've got your app dot dot com. Uh, website up on my screen right now, and actually looks like Florian Buschek put uh, uh, put up the transcript of the earnings call with his yeah. highlights of the most important things to read there. Uh, what can you tell us about Breakout Investors and what y'all are doing there? Yeah, my Substack post is also linked in there, and we also okay. just recently started a WhatsApp room, um, so you can. Uh, those of you that follow Mark, you can ask about it in his pro research room. I'm sure somebody can drop a link in there to our WhatsApp room. Uh, but really what we are is just a network of investors that try to collaborate with one another. Uh, so the breakout investor is someone who does their own research, uh, develops their own ideas, their own picks of stocks. And we end up you know, posting our information in there mostly to be able to collaborate with one another. And what we, what we found out – you know, Mark, you found out the same thing, and this is, you know, how I got to where I'm at, and, and ultimately how I found Permafix is, you know, I learned from you how to research these names, what to, and start collaborating with people. And, you know, we're looking to uh, make money together in investments, and and so what we tend to find is that there will be someone in almost any name, uh, someone besides the initial breakout investor that gets really interested and starts providing their own uh, research, and maybe even having their own calls. Yep. Uh, the company. And, and, and in this case, uh, two of us break out investors, myself and Florian. I, I found Permafix, but Florian got really interested in the opportunity. And he dove and in. So he's contributing at least as much uh, as I have been. Well, we're, ha- we're going to have to have him on the we're going to have to have him on the show next. Um, you know, so uh, we got the we got your website on the screen here. Um, you know, 100 percent, you know, like you, the work you guys there is tremendous. 
And I would say that, you know, it's it's a big part. It's actually saved us a lot of work. You know, the folks that I work clo most closely with, we now take a, a lot of the work that you guys do and say, you know what, before we look at any new name, let's look at the work that they've done to see which ones of these we really like ourselves. And, you know, I'll be honest, I, I don't I don't like all the picks that you guys do, but I love all the work you do. You know, it, it's clear. Like all the picks that I do. <laughs> So, I mean, yeah, well, sometimes I'll have a pick or I'll have a name, but I, I still follow. So if you look in our rooms, by, by the way, you know, don't make sure that people are aware that just because a name is in a room, it doesn't mean we're still bullish on it. Uh, it, it means that we've already done some research and that, uh, you know, if you want to post about that stock, you should do in that room because there's already people in that room that are interested in it. So, like, there's a lot of different names that I have that I've followed. Some of them I made money on, and then, you know, I exited the position. Some of them I lost, and I exited the position. Great. Uh, some of them I've lost, and I'm still in the position. Some of them, like, Permafix, I'm up, but I'm still in the position. Well, so, one of the... You know, it, it really varies. So don't take, you know, just because a, a stock is listed in the room or we're following it or covering it, don't take, take that to mean that it's, uh, that we're bullish on the name, but... Well, one of the things that I like about it is that it gives me the opportunity. One of the things that I love about it is that it gives me and my group the opportunity to go through those names, so I can come on here each week and let people know which ones we love are those picks. So um, I appreciate that, Aaron, and um, you know we're gonna send them your way. You know, for those of you watching at home, it's app app at break dot breakoutinvestors dot com, and uh, that'll take you to their site. There's also a great Permafix um, interview that was done on February 7th. So if you, um, and I've had this up on my screen you know, for several weeks, and if you go down back to February 7th, what you'll find is that the stock was just at 575. This stock has nearly doubled since Aaron put up that interview. So Aaron, uh, any last words? I, I want to really thank you for all this. Yeah, no, I thank you, Mark, for, you know, mentoring me over the years and, and continuing to collaborate. And uh, I would just advise people as well. A lot of people like to use the mobile app. So the app.breakoutinvestors.com is is for the desktop. If you go to the App Store or Google Play Store, you can find our app for your phone as well. A lot of people use that. Fantastic. Hey, and, and by the way, as always, uh, ladies and gentlemen, I do not take any compensation. I only provide these um, you know, these folks, and I only endorse these products because I use them myself, just so you know, um, these are not commercials. This is really information on things that I think can make you money. Aaron, thank you very much. I appreciate your thank time. You, oh, by the way, we do have a question in the queue. Uh, somebody asked, does, does uh, Permafix have any patents? It's a great question. I'm not sure if they have any patents or not, but what I can tell you is that, uh, I mean, in addition to, you know, any sort of proprietary uh, information and knowledge and, and technologies that they have, you have an enormous barrier to entry just in terms of getting permits. So for, right. you know, if a company were to start up, it would, it would take them a minimum five years, if, if not a decade or more to get all the permitting that was, that's needed. And, and that, that's why most of the companies uh, in this business are, are a lot bigger than yep. Permafix. And it's also likely why Permafix is going to be uh, bought out once all of the implications of Hanford are, 100% clear, meaning after the ITDC contract is awarded and Permafix sort of figures out a chunk of that, they're going to be thing. I agree with that. Hey, uh, once again, thanks a lot, Aaron. Appreciate your time, and, and, and thanks again for coming on last week and, and giving us the heads up before this big run that we've had in this stock. It's beautiful, and, and hopefully you're right that this is just the beginning. I mean, if they put up those numbers, it certainly is. There's no way a company putting up $2 uh, run rate in 24 and $3 run rate in 25 is going to stay at $10. Bucks. Um, right. we'll, just see, we'll just see what the path is to get there. So um, thanks a lot, and we'll catch you soon. Thank you, Mark. All right, thanks. That was Aaron Warwick from Breakout Investors. That was our second guest for today. Um, hope you enjoyed that. Uh, put your Q and A in the chat, okay? We're gonna get to. We're gonna. We're gonna do a little Q and A session in a minute. I'm gonna check my notes to make sure that I've uh, put everything out there that you guys need to know. Um, we'll take one quick step back onto the market, and this is what you guys really need to know about the market. Number one. Go and read. Go and get the read the lessons that I put out there on my blog site. Download the app. Look at the for the beginner section. You really need to understand the rules. It's not hard to learn the rules of what to do in a yellow alert. It's not hard to read these charts. What's hard is finding these picks. To find a permafix, right, is very challenging because you need to be able to do professional research. 
I'm not asking you to do that. I'm not saying that you need to learn how to do that. In fact, I'm telling you, you probably shouldn't. Unless you love the idea of doing so and you want to pursue that passion, I definitely would encourage that. But it is not a requirement at all. All you have to do is follow the professional work that we do on our end. And then once we build these charts here, then you can look at these charts and understand how your risk and reward changes as the stock moves up through the chart. So as you can see here with Permafix, there is still plenty of room for the stock to move up, maybe even as high as $17 a share, according to these lines, right? But there's also room for it to move down and maybe it takes a a breather, right? So put that into your calculus when you think about, man, I don't own any of this, but I really want to own some. Maybe you own a little bit instead of piling at these levels and hoping it pulls back. What happens then is if it pulls back, obviously you lose money on that first chunk that you bought, but then you get an opportunity to buy another chunk. And that's how you build a position. But if you buy a whole bunch now and it goes down, you're going to regret it, right? If you buy a little bit and it keeps going up, you might regret it. But the most important thing is to protect your money, not to go for the gold. The way we do things, you're going to get rich over time by being patient. And that goes back to the uh, slide that I always have here, right? Warren Buffett says the stock market is a device for transferring money from the impatient to the patient. So one of the rules that are difficult to follow is being patient, right? Another rule is to follow the charts in helping you identify how big to be in a position, okay? If we were still down here with all this information, you'd want to back up the truck like no tomorrow. Up here, still attractive. But you don't want to be as aggressive because a lot of the meat has come off the bone, even though there's still a lot of meat left on the bone. All right? And that's how you do it. And it's pretty simple from that perspective. Okay? Hopefully that makes sense. All right. Now, from a macro perspective, what does that mean for the market? Of course, I showed you already. We're getting close to some lines here, to the orange line. Now, for you newbies, as I promised, my colored lines, the red, the green, and the orange are fundamentally based proprietary lines that I draw based on math, professional math that helped me be a consultant to folks like Jim Cramer back in my uh, consulting days. Okay, So you'll notice they, these lines don't seem to make too much sense relative to the chart. The stock went, you know, the market went right above these green lines. That was not the purpose. These are not technical lines. The technical lines are white. Okay, so the white lines you see are technical, the stuff that you're used to seeing, right? The colored lines are the cheat code, the fundamental lines based on math that help you understand what something should actually be worth. So if you're a long-term investor and you don't want to, you know, make trades every couple of months or so, I would say orange line is typically a good time to get in for a long-term investor. I think we're going lower. I think there's a chance that we can go much, much lower from here. But if I zoom out of this chart, what you'll find is the stock market typically spends very little time under the orange. It spends most of its time above the orange, and that's usually a good time to buy for a long-term investor. But <clears throat> for folks that follow my methodology, no. We're in yellow alert. I'm 50% hedged. So in other words, <clears throat> for every dollar that I'm long, and I have many stocks that I love, PESI being one of them, I own that stock because I think I got to own that stock. That's proven right. The stock's up big since I bought it, right? And the market's down big since I bought it. So what we do is to protect ourselves, if we don't like the market, we short the market, not the stocks that we love. So I was afraid of the market. I told you guys the market looks like it's going to take another leg down. But at the same time, we had PESI come on the radar screen. Back here on March 10th is when I went live on PSI as an official pick, or right here. Okay? I made it an official pick here, even though I thought the market was about to tank. Right? So I buy PESI, and then what do I do at the same time? I buy RWM. Or I short, I, I short IWM, or I buy RWM. So if I show you RWM, look at that. So I made money on RWM, which protected me in case the tanking stock market pulled PES die down, which it will do. The market will tend to pull down all stocks. In this case, it didn't, right? But 
If it does, you're going to make money on the RWM because the RWM goes up. All that stuff is in my uh, educational content, so I'm not going to repeat it any further here. Instead, I'm going to give you guys the information you need to know about where we're going next. Um, and here it is. Number one, um, you know, obviously, we could go anywhere over the next couple of weeks, but there is more dominoes to drop. We have Janet Yellen, the Treasury Secretary, called an emergency meeting today. An emergency meeting. We already had the Fed this week, so what emergency has cropped up? They already didn't they already solve the banking problem? So what emergency came up that they're gonna have a meeting behind closed doors? It's not for the public consumption. An emergency meeting. Okay? It's because there's another domino to drop. It's because the excess savings, I've talked about this before, has depleted, and in the same time credit has gone through the roof, all time highs in credit with higher interest rates than we've seen in over 10 years, right? All that's bad, but on top of it all, because of what's going on at the banks, the banks are now reluctant to give out more credit, and we have seen the usage of credit just hit a wall. And that's what sends us into a recession. I think we're in a recession right now. I think we're already in a recession, and you're not going to hear about it until they make the official call, which is going to happen a year or so from now. They don't make the call on a recession until long after it's already occurred and sometimes after it's already over. A lot of big help that is. And it's obvious why they don't do that though. The government doesn't want to panic the public. So they're not going to tell you that we're in a recession because then you're going to stop spending money and that makes the recession worse. But I'm here to tell you about these things so you don't lose your money on the stock market. So you can make the right moves and keep your money if not make money. All right? We're obviously always trying to make it, but importantly, we're also trying to keep it. And that's why these profits that we've had on the easy money portfolio, 36% a year going back to uh, 2014 on average. And then the easy money portfolio, you can see we are dead even. And I haven't even, oh yeah, the permafix is in there. We are dead even going back to the beginning of 2021, even though the market's down 23%. That is good. Zero is actually great in this environment because everybody else has lost money and now stocks are at a lower level and we haven't lost any of our money so now we get to put our money in and when this finally bottoms out start making money at a fast pace because the market moves faster off of lows not off of highs so everybody else that lost a quarter of their money they're gonna need to make 33 percent to get back to even if you got a hundred bucks and you lose 25%, you got 75 bucks left. To get back to 100, you have to make 33% just to get back to even. We're going to start with that same $100 and we're going to be at 133 while everybody else is just getting back to even. We're going to be at all-time highs. People are just going to be getting it back to even. That's what these rules help you to do. Okay? So, that's it on that as far as the lesson goes. Um, the last thing I'm going to say is we now have four and a half percent interest rates on money market accounts okay if your money is in bank of america or wells fargo or whatever check to see what interest rate they're paying you on that money because you can get four and a half percent in a money market account somewhere else there are other banks out there and money market accounts paying four and a half percent why get zero when you get four and a half percent for free four and a half percent is better than the zero i've gotten and it's way better than the negative 23% everybody else is experiencing. And by the way, me telling you this in a small way is going to make this banking situation worse because people are realizing that they're getting zero from the bank when they can be getting 4.5% from a different bank or a money market account. And that's why we're seeing this crisis because banks like, um, you know, I'm not going to name the bank, but a, a bank gave me my mortgage at 2.75% for 15 years. Okay, and they were able to do that because they were borrowing money at zero, but now they have to borrow money at four and a half, which means they're losing money. I have a, a, a line of credit that I took out. I'm paying one and a half percent on that line of credit, and all I did with that, all I have that money in right now is in a money market account paying four and a half percent. This bank lent me money at one and a half percent a couple of years ago and now I'm making four and a half percent for free and paying them back one and a half percent. They are the ones giving me the four and a half percent, which makes it even crazier. So they're paying me three percent on money that they lent me. 
my interest rate is negative 3%. So it's not hard to understand why banks are in trouble right now. Okay, so go get that money. Go get your four and a half percent. Last thing on earnings, we'll take you to the S and P 500 in terms of where we could go in terms of valuation. Okay, I have said already before that my target, and it's always been written here, is that we can go to 150. There's the X on IWM by July, which is the equivalent of 3,200 on the S and P 500. So let's go to the S and P 500 chart. Here's 3,200 down here. Okay. So you can see where my target is around 3,200 right around here. And this would be the path roughly to get to that 3,200. Now, here's the problem with that. That's, that's been my number for over a year. Okay. So way back when the, when the market was 4,500, 4,400, 4,300, I'm saying 3,200. And people say, you're crazy. Well, we got all the way down to 3,500 before bouncing. And now I think we're on the next leg down towards that 3,200. Not only that, but in a recession, which I believe we are in, the average recession takes earnings down 17% from its peak. Average. I think we're going to have a worse than average earnings recession, but we'll just keep it average. If there's an average earnings recession, S&P earnings will come in at $188 per S&P share. Okay. Now, Carl Icahn, a legend, and I follow the legends over myself. If the legends tell me we're having a bull market, I'm going to change my mind. But Jeffrey Gunlock, Carl Icahn, Warren Buffett, by he hasn't said anything, but he's got a huge cash position now. He built a huge cash position, okay? Uh, and um, Stan Druckenmiller, these are heroes to me. These are billionaires, legends, all of them showing bearish signs. If not, absolutely saying there's another shoe to drop. Gunlock, uh, Icon, definitely out there saying this is going to get worse. Okay, and it makes sense because our Carl Icon said that the stock market doesn't bottom until it gets to at least 15 PE on earnings. Well, I just did the math on an average recession taking our earnings to 188. If I give a 15 PE on the 188, I get third. I get 2820. Not 3,200, 2,820, which is way down here. So if you think we've already had a bad ride, imagine that we get down to here, which I believe is a very good possibility. I'm going to be very long by the time we get there, right? Because when we get down to 3,200, I'm going to take a lot of hedges off because we're going to be really cheap here on the market. And at that point, there might be a 50-50 bet whether we go lower. I don't want to guess if we're going to go lower. I'm a long-term investor, so I'm not going to be afraid of owning the market down here. We're going to be pretty close to the red line, okay? So this is what you want to start doing. You want to start, we're going to start getting more long at these levels. And if it goes lower, we get more long. And if it gets down here, we're going to back up the truck. And if it goes even lower than that, no big deal. We're going to wait because what's going to happen after that is eventually we are going to have a bounce in the market. And from these levels, from 125, the green line will be then at 250. We're going to have a clear path to double our money. So you definitely want to average costs down through there, but not yet. We're still 100% hedged. We're waiting for these levels right here, which I think is a safe bet for when we start getting more long because the earnings picture looks like we're going to go to 188. Carl Icahn says we need a PE of 15. He's the billionaire. He's the smartest man in the room, not me. I'm just following his lead. And that what he's saying tells us that we could go to 2820 on the S&P 500, which is a long way down from here. So buckle up. All right, let's get to some stocks. Actually, let's get to some Q&A real quick, and then we'll talk about SMSI, INFU, TPCS, and then we'll do another round of uh, Q&A, and we'll be done for the day. Uh, 3.09, we're going to have to speed it up, because I'd really like to be done um, by the bottom of the hour here at 3.30. Let's see what we got here. Um, Q&A, Q&A. What a week. Yes, indeed, what a week. Um, can you talk about SMSI's cash situation and potential uh, dilution risk again? Yes, Jay. I've talked. I talked about this the last couple weeks. So go check out the last. I'm not going to get into detail about it, but I'll answer your question. But then you can go and look at my past videos for more answers on that. With the banks tightening credit, could be a problem for SMSI as they need to raise cash. We're getting a lot of question about 
um, SMSI. We'll get that in a moment. But that'll be the next thing we talk about. Let's take care of any questions not related to SMSI. Why doesn't unemployment show in the data? Okay, so we've got um, we have all we've got a, a tight labor market. It's less tight than it was, but it got very tight. It got to the point where people, you know, companies were desperate to hire employees, right? Now that's not every company though. So as the economy gets weak, you have these dominoes. I'm talking about the dominoes, right? The dominoes start falling. You get these companies that do layoffs. Google, Facebook, you've seen these layoffs. You've heard it in the news, right? And what happens is in a tight labor market, somebody gets fired by the first dominoes that are falling and they quickly get hired by those desperate companies over here that haven't fallen yet. So they don't end up showing up in the unemployment data. But they got laid off over here and hired over here, which made the labor market less tight because these companies, as these companies lay people off and these companies hire those people that get laid off, the demand for labor starts to drop. Okay? And what eventually happens is the weakness that these guys experience starts to trickle through the economy and what happens is that these companies that were desperate for labor become less desperate not only because they found the employees they were looking for but because they no longer need as many employees as they thought in the first place because the economy is starting to get weak so what's happening is you're having this transfer of employment that's happening and so it doesn't look unemployment doesn't look like it's ticking up but what's happening is demand for labor is dropping like a rock and what eventually happens is we get to this level where the folks getting laid off stop finding jobs from the desperate companies because there's no longer desperate companies to hire and they just stay laid off and they go on unemployment insurance and they start showing up in the unemployment data so it's not showing up yet it's going to and you can google this if you don't believe me I just gave you an education but you can google it employment is usually like the last thing to drop showing uh, 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 economic weakness. So you see the, the stock market has already started dropping. They're not talking, you know, we're talking about a recession. In fact, Jerome Powell, when the Fed came on this week, he said, and I quote, I still see a path to a soft landing and we're trying to find it. Okay? In other words, we don't think there's going to be a soft landing, but we, we're we trying hard to find it. We still think that there is a path to a soft landing, and we're trying hard to find it. That's not good news. That's very concerning. That means that the most likely scenario, by far, is that we have a recession, that we don't find that path. He's looking for a path to not having a recession. That means we're probably going to have a recession unless he, by chance, finds that one path that will allow us to not. That's what he said. Okay? So be careful out there. Um, and, and that's why, so, so uh, the other thing there is, so we already have all these signs going on, right? And we have Jerome Powell saying things like this, and yet unemployment still doesn't show the weakness that has been evident in the stock market. It's evident in the banks. It's evident what Jerome Powell said this week. It's evident everywhere, right? But it doesn't show up in the unemployment data until later, okay? And that is common. Google it. You'll find out for yourself that I'm not lying to you. Okay, let's keep going. Um, question marks, question marks. Uh, is Aaron still long SMSI? Sorry, I didn't get to ask him. Um, I believe he is, by the way. And then the last question before we go to SMSI and stocks and Chartorama. In fact, we can do some Chartorama. Um, these are companies that I might be interested in from the long side. Okay, doesn't mean that I'm long. These are just companies that I'm interested in. So if you're looking at stock, looking for stocks that might be of interest to me, they should be of interest to you. Um, these are they. Okay, I believe. Um, yeah, this is. These are the long ones. Let me just make sure. Yep, these are the companies I'm interested in on the long side. So this little chart will rama for you while I answer this question. Maybe you covered this in your educational videos. Working through those currently. Good. Watch my educational videos. There is a playlist. Um, I have a playlist on um, uh, on my YouTube channel. Look for the playlist. There's Money Mark University. Totally free. 
educational videos, they have the least views. So I already know that a lot of you don't read, you know, watch the educational videos. If you want to get rich, watch the educational videos. Do you want to get rich? Do you want to make millions? Do you want to do what I did and went from a basement paying $130, $143 a month? I was sharing an unfinished basement. $143 a month was my rent. So you can imagine how crappy it was. And now I'm in a penthouse on Miami Beach because I watched the educational videos. It's up to you. I don't care if you do it or not. I don't know who you are. I don't know almost any of you. Okay? So I'll never know if you become rich or not unless you end up telling me. And people tell me all the time I became rich because of you. But if you don't become rich, I'm not going to find out about it. Because you're going to feel bad that you didn't watch the educational videos and that you didn't become rich. It's your choice. Not up to me. I'm, I'm just leading the horses to water. Whether or not you drink is up to you. Anyways, maybe you covered this in your educational videos, but can you explain how holding RWM works over months or years when it's supposedly bad to hold longer than a day? No, that's not true. It's not true that it's bad to hold RWM for longer than a day. Um, it is bad to hold, um, and, and I don't know the ticker symbols, but... The, the two X's and the three X's is something like SQQQ. There we go. Ultra. Any of these ultra shorts, these are bad because they actually invest. And watch, I'll show you. Look at This is not something you want to be involved with. The reason is that they use like options and futures and things that carry premium to lever up. Okay? And I don't have time to explain it today. You should Google it if you don't understand it. But stay away from this stuff. This is only for traders. This is for the 1 in 20 people. I'm not one of them. I do not. I, I never buy SQQQ. Never. Never. Because it is levered up. Because it's an ultra. Because it's a 2x. And those things are rubbish for you. Okay? RWM has gone down a long time. But not the same way. Because the market's gone down. But what you see here is that it has periods like it. You could see the last couple years. It, it's been doing great, right? If I zoom in, RWM's been a great investment for well over a year. It's up 30% over the last year, uh, 1.4 years, okay? RWM is the way to go, not SQQQ, not anything ultra, not anything that doubles up, okay? From roaches to the basement, yeah, and to the penthouse in Miami, absolutely. Um, can I clarify T? Okay, so we got a question about TPCS. We'll get that in a minute. Let's, um, let's go to the stocks. Okay, so um, here's the latest news and notes on stocks. <clears throat> Let's see. Um, oh, you know what? First, let me let me give you another one first because this one's will be quick. Um, INFU. I gave you this one uh, last week. I told y'all. Uh, I think they cleared the decks. Right? They lowered guidance. They they took out. They made things as conservative as possible. They were too aggressive on their guidance last year, and that's why the stock went down. Okay, They were too optimistic about the ramping of some programs, and they included those programs in their guidance. Okay, In hindsight, they shouldn't have, and clearly their stock has been penalized for that. Okay, What they did on their earnings call um, that was just put out recently, and you, you can go to Seeking Alpha or whatever, and you can find um, transcripts on this. Okay, I use a service here called Ticker T I K R. And I can type in I N F U. All right, and I can type in the transcripts. March fifteenth, so just last week. There's a whole transcript of what they talked about, and basically what they said was that they were basically taking out of guidance all of the anticipation of the ramp up of these partnerships that they put in place last year. Okay, so last year. They put it in the guidance, and it didn't really happen. This year, they're taking it out of the guidance, but it's more likely to happen now because it's been a year. Okay, And this is how it happens, time after time after time. Partnerships take longer to ramp up than we expect. Okay, And so they have a year under their belt now with these partnerships, and now I do believe these partnerships are going to ramp up. And the best part about it is even if they don't, it's not in the guidance anymore. So now the company is set up to beat their guidance, and as a result, Shockingly, if you go to Insider Cow and type in INFU, what you'll find is we've had insider buying. Okay, buying, buying, buying. Three purchases by the CEO, the CFO, and the COO all purchased shares of INFU. Okay, um, just in the last few days. All right, after I told you, 
Why? Because management has to wait. They have a blackout period. Okay? So I told you guys about it, and then back here, and now here it is, the stock's starting to tick up. And by the way, what that does is it increases the chances that they get into the Russell. If the stock gets to about 850 per share based on the current IWM level, we're here at about 171 on IWM. If Infu Systems can get to 850, or if I, or if IWM keeps going down, right? Basically, in other words, if INFU outperforms the market for the next few weeks, they can get into the Russell. And if they can get into the Russell, I think the stock goes straight into the double digits because they will be forced buying. And I've told you guys this about this before. The last time they had forced buying from getting into the Russell, this is what happened. They blew right past the top of the green line. Okay, so I've been a buyer of INFU. I've been considering making it an official pick. It is one of my largest unofficial picks right now. I'm just doing a little bit more work on this, so stay tuned. But this one I, I really like right now because the insider buying, because the guidance has been lower to conservative levels that they should be able to just walk over. And they are a healthcare play, which means they are resistant to recession. People still need health care in any situation, especially when insurance is paying for it. And these guys have a lot of insurance companies paying um, for the work that the patients have going on with INFU. So INFU is getting that business from the patients. The patients are getting reimbursed from the insurance companies. And that is very recession resilient. So I like this name a lot. All right. Now let's get to SMSI. Um, the 10K is out. So let's go to the 10K, all right? This is the annual report, which none of you read, of course, but professionals read the 10K, the annual report. I'm not saying that none of you read it. I'm sure some of you do, and I don't expect y'all to read it, right? You come here, I'm going to tell you what's going on with this stuff, so no big deal, right? I'm not here to shame y'all on that. No big deal. That's shame on me if I don't, but I did, and what you see here, right? And it's funny. You have to go through the whole document. I don't know how many pages this thing is. We got... F23, I'm not going to even count it. We got, it, it's, it's, it's like 100 pages, let's just say, right? The last paragraph, all right, is really what we want to focus in on. And that's where it says, the company has been reviewing its cost structure and begun taking steps to reduce its expenses, finally. What I've been telling you they need to do, finally. On March 13th, the company began making workforce reductions, finally. Executing termination, by the way, bad for the economy, of course, good for SMSI because they're cutting their expenses, which is needed to get them to profitability, which I told you that they can get to, okay, because their expense base is so high and because their revenue base is not dependent on their expense base. Their revenue is from subscriptions of customers that keep the product year after year and pay them no matter whether they do more R&D or not. But they've done a lot of R&D lately. They've spent a lot on marketing and sales lately. So they can eat off of that for a while. And they should because we're going to a rough patch. And what you do in a rough patch is make sure your company's profitable so you don't get into trouble with your debt, your covenants, all that stuff. And that's some of the questions in the queue that I'm going to answer in a second. right? But take a look here. We got $50 million of revenue and we got $60 million of expenses. That's, that's a loss. But they came on and they said that they were going to cut their expenses by $4 million a quarter. $4 million a quarter, $16 million a year, $16 million a year, gets the expense base down quite a bit, even further than where it, they've already cut it quite a bit. If I go to the quarterly numbers, you'd see that it gets them pretty close to profitability. Okay, And so what we see in the 10K is that they're doing that. Now, I say they still need to do a little more, and they definitely can. The expense cuts that they make... I think that they can make even more, no problem. I have, I have no issue. I don't believe that they have any risk of bankruptcy. I don't think they have much risk on their debt side because their debt, they got to pay uh, $1.5 million a month for 10 months to pay off this debt. But they have cash on the balance sheet. Okay, They had $14 million on the balance sheet coming into this year. You could pay $1.5 million Per month, no problem on that for several, several months. In the meantime, like the 10K says, they have been reducing their workforce. You can read this yourself as I go along, right, in, in specifics of what they've done. In uh, total, 
the actions they're taking is going to reduce their workforce by 26%. That's a huge cut off the expense base. That is good news, not bad news, because they already upgraded their product. It's brand spanking new. They've integrated the acquired products. Brand spanking new. You buy a brand spanking new car, guess what? You don't have to spend on maintenance. You're on a warranty. The new car is going to last and run very nicely for a long time before you have to spend any new money. That's what they do. Did They bought a new car. And so now they can cut all the expenses right, and become profitable. And what's the, that's what I'm hoping they do is to turn profitable so they can show potential creditors and debtors all the, that they deserve to keep that line of credit open, right, or open a line of credit, keep that debt outstanding so they can make some of these payments, pay the one and a half, one and a half, one and a half for a few months, right, show them profitability in a few months as these expense cuts um, start to take hold, and then they go back to the creditors and say, look, look what we've done. We went from wildly unprofitable, we went from losing, look how much they lost last year, it was crazy, all right, they went from losing I think it was $35 million, okay? $30 million. $30 million of operating losses. And if they can go from $30 million of operating losses to break even in one year, creditors are going to be happy to lend them money. To say, you know what? Stop paying the one and a half a month. We'll let you keep that money for a while if you need to. I believe they will be able to renegotiate um, their credit agreements um, once these cuts take place uh, and which they say as of June 30th this will all be completed already they made workforce reductions on March 13th okay in Portugal in the US on March 14th they announced the closure of their Slovakian operations which will be effective June 30th I'm sure people are already being ushered out, but it's going to take till June 30th to complete that, but they've already completed some layoffs already. We see them on LinkedIn. A lot of folks are popping up on LinkedIn, and on March 17th, they notified employees in Serbia that uh, uh, positions were being eliminated, so they already cut uh, workforce in, Serb uh, in Serbia. So moves being made in the right direction at Smith. Um, finally, what I'll tell you is they had, um, you know, if I break down the quarter, Go back to the chart. If I break down the quarter, the family safety, which is really what we're excited about, that's the main part of the business that we're most excited about, actually was up in Q4 versus Q3. Okay? So it stopped declining and actually started to move up. Okay? This is what we've been waiting for. Now, it's not going to be, um, you know, we're not going to see a big ramp up quite yet. They told us that, but at least the bleeding has stopped there. In the meantime, ComSuite was down in the quarter, but that's because the Smith customer base got moved over to the T-Mobile system. That's not going to happen again. So ComSuite can start to stop bleeding as well. ViewSpot had a weak quarter, all right, and it's that's a lumpy business, and they just came out with a new shiny version of, of, uh, of ViewSpot, so now we can start to see that ramp up as well. Okay, so we see plenty of signs that the guidance that they gave for revenue to decline by two to five percent, they can beat that guidance at least be at the high end of the guidance and only be down two percent, which is very nominal compared to the twenty six percent cuts that we're seeing in workforce. Okay, so let me go to the Q and A now on SMSI. And we'll move on to the rest. We're going to go a little over uh, three thirty today, but let's get everything done real quick. We don't have much else to do. Um, we got uh, TPCS Q and A, and we're done. Um, so, can you talk about SMSI's cash situation, potential dilution risk? So, Jay, bottom line on the dilution risk is, um, from what I understand, it's going to be up to them. Okay, um, I believe they can cut down to to the profitability, but in the meantime, they have plenty of money to pay off a million and a half with cash, cash, cash every month for several months. Right? In the meantime, their financial situation should get better, 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 which should give them uh, the firepower to go back and say, listen, lend us some money, right? or we get a new renegotiation, give us another year, let's halt the payments for now, give us another year because AT&T is going to start ramping up on back to school, and then we're going to be good. 
And I think the creditors will be happy to do that because they'll be making a profit on the money from a company that they see profitable and has the ability to be very profitable. That makes it, That's a safe investment. That's what the banks are going to be looking for in this environment. There's not a lot of safe investments. They make themselves look safe by cutting these expenses back and starting to ramp up revenue, and then they can avoid dilution. Right, which they do not need to know, do right now because they've got enough cash to make those payments for several months. So it's up to them to cut expenses enough to avoid dilution, which I don't think is going to be necessary for at least six months. They've got a six-month leeway, I think, where they can be paying off um, this debt the way that they're supposed to, one and a half million a month, and show the creditors, hey, look at us. Let's renegotiate. Give us uh, another 15 mil. You know, uh, uh, of you know the line, and we'll pay it back next year as this AT and T and T Mobile ramp up. So I don't think there's yet a problem. I think they could be more aggressive. I told you that on previous calls, okay? And we're gonna push for them to be more aggressive. Let's see how this quarter shakes out. What I would love to see, right? And the quarter ends next week, and then a few weeks later they're gonna get they're gonna give us the call. So the guidance is safe. They gave us the guidance just a couple weeks ago, so they already knew what the quarter was going to be, pretty much, all right? And then they're going to give us guidance for Q2. I think there's a decent chance they guide us to profitability in Q2, and if they do, this stock should really take off because this stock has really collapsed to a level that indicates risk of bankruptcy where I don't see a risk of bankruptcy. And by the way, I've made a lot of money on risk of bankruptcy plays. You can see... TPCS being one of them, there's a risk of bankruptcy back here. Didn't happen. If you bought down here with the risk of bankruptcy that I didn't think was going to happen, you made a ton of money. I wasn't I wasn't live here doing this, so I didn't make that pick for y'all, but that was a good example. And then there was also Iridex, you can see. That was an example I did give. That was a pick I gave. I bought this stock at 1, and it went all the way to 9 because there was a bankruptcy dilution risk that was eliminated. Okay, so here's a stock that went to one because of bankruptcy and dilution risk fears and went to nine. You wouldn't have believed it at the time because of what it had done. Look familiar? This is what professional research is all about. Does it mean I'll be right? No. But even if there's a 50-50 chance, I'm right two out of three times. That's more than 50-50. So if we have only, only a 50-50 chance of me being right in this situation. You have a 50-50 chance of going from 1 to 10. You get paid 10x. You could get paid 10x on a 50-50 bet. You make your bet, but you don't put all your money on that bet because if it comes up tails, you lose all your money. So that's what you got to think about. You size your position based on risk. Now, by the way, I'm not saying it's a 50-50 chance we go to 10. It's a 50-50. It's more than a 50-50 chance that they come out of this fine. And, and I think 50-50 that we go to 5 or 6, okay? And then to get to 10, maybe it's a 1 in 5 shot that we get to 10. But I think there's at least a 50-50 bet that we go to 5 or 6, um, you know, maybe in the next year or so, okay? That's a great bet from these levels. Just keep in mind that there is also a small chance. And even if I'm wrong, by the way, it doesn't mean they go bankrupt. The chances of going bankrupt, I think, are 1 in 50, okay? Small, small chance they go bankrupt, right? There you go. Um, Q&A. What else we got? Um, with the banks tightening credit, could it be a problem for SMSI if they need to raise cash? Yes. And that's why they're taking the actions. They called it profound, right? A profound change. Look, from a human standpoint, think of how hard, like, and they brought this upon themselves, okay? They did bring this upon themselves, but I still feel bad. I've gone through layoffs, and you don't know how heart-wrenching it is to decide who to fire, who to sit in front of eye to eye and say, I'm sorry, you're not going to be able to feed your family next week because I have to let you go. It's easy for us as investors to say, cut expenses. We need profitability so we can make money, right? That's easy to do. But on the other side, there's a human element to that. And, and they made a very steep cut 26 percent they took 26 percent of all their people and they had to go eye to eye to those people and let them know that they no longer have a job okay i think they need to do more but let's just keep that in perspective okay um so that's where we are with that um 
I know you don't like to pay premium, but I bought the July SMSI calls. Um, I didn't like Schwab restricting cash for the amount of the exercise price on the sold puts. Is this normal? I don't know, Ronald. This is part of the reason why I don't do this. Okay. Um, I don't like buying call options because you're paying a premium for a deadline. When you buy the stock, you're not paying a premium and there's no deadline. I pay a dollar for the stock and, and it doesn't expire unless the company goes bankrupt. Okay. I have no expiration date on my Smith Infinity One calls. This is actually a zero call when you pay one dollar for the stock. Um, so I can't answer that question for you. Sorry. It's not part of my calculus. It's not part of my methodology. It's not part of what I teach. Um, and you know that. But I'm sorry. This is the week that I pick on you. Um, you are a great viewer. Thank you, by the way, Ron. And, and thank you for the question. Don't be shy about questions. But just, just know that to teach everybody else, sometimes I'm going to make an example out of you guys. So please do ask um, dumb questions. Nobody's going to make fun of you. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to yell at you for the sake of the rest of the class. But that's not an embarrassment, okay? It's so you learn, so you can make more money. Um, I love Ron. Oh, okay, we got that, we got that. I think we're almost done. Um, boom. To educational videos, SMSI thoughts, are they cutting costs? We just went through that. Okay. Um, at some point, can you take a look at Hillion? No, Ed, um, so if you're new to me, I, I don't take requests. If you've done a professional, if you're a professional, if you're a Wall Street professional, if you work at a mutual fund or something, and you have um, a thesis, if you've looked at a stock and you've got a write-up that you want to share with me, I will review that with my team, okay? But it needs to be a professional analysis and all that. I get, you can imagine, with 2,000 subscribers, 1,000 views a week, I get... 500 communications per day, okay, and I end up having to delete almost all of them, um, but I don't delete all of them, all right, there is things that come in, and you see the permafix that came in, and we made a lot of money off of that, those are the professional analyses that get put on my plate, uh, and I'll go through them, and then I'll validate that information, and then I give those picks to you guys, that's how it works, okay, uh, but thank you, Ed, it's a, it's a very legitimate question. Uh, back to SMSI, was a vote required for share issuance here, or did they elect for the let the shareholders decide? Um, James, I don't know the answer to that question. We could check the proxies or, or ask um, IR. I'm personally not worried about it because at the end of the day, um, you know, what's going to happen is going to, I think what's going to happen is what I've described. Okay, if it doesn't happen, so be it. I'll, I'll deal with the consequences. But, you know, we've got a very good CFO there. Um, you know, he is obviously hamstrung a little bit by a CFO that holds him back. Uh, I mean, a CEO that holds him back. But Jim Kempton, it, it, I think, is a very good CFO. He was endorsed by the prior CFO, Tim Huffmeyer, who's also a very good CFO. By the way, he's going to be a, the CFO of a public company very soon. So we're going to talk about that soon. Um, but I'm going to let Jim do his job. You know, so I'm not going to worry about that too much, especially at these levels, knowing that they can cut expenses to profitability and resolve that capital structure issue very easily. Okay. Um, let's see your thoughts on the upcoming investor meeting with board and pay terms to vote on. Um, I don't want to comment too much on that. This is my, um, you know, that's the last question on SMSI before I get to don't apologize. Ed. That was a good question. That was a good question. Um, I'm not going to get too much into that, but I, I, I've gotten to the point where I'm going to vote no on everything, just to send a message to them. I'm going to vote no on everything that they want to do, okay? Unless it's you know cutting more employees, which they can do without my vote, get to profitability, and then I'll start voting yes to the things you want. But as a shareholder, I'm fed up, okay? I'm absolutely fed up. If I was in, if I was the type to get involved with activism, I would be an activist on this already. OK, no offense. I like those guys. You know, I've shook hands with these guys. I spent time with these guys. I, I like these people as people. But as a shareholder of the company, I do believe that they have done a poor, clearly done a poor job of, of fiduciary stewards of our capital. And it's their job to do so. You get fired for not doing their, your job and they are not doing their job. And here we are with the stock at a dollar. This is lower than the price that I originally paid for the stock. Okay, I took a lot of profits off the table when it got to the green line like you're supposed to. So I went from one to seven, made more money on this stock than I ever made on any stock in my life. But now with the position I had left, gone all the way round trip to one. You have 
screwed us and you've screwed yourselves. The largest shareholder, Bill, is, is, is the biggest, the person that's been punished the most is Bill because he's the biggest shareholder and his net worth has gone down like almost 90%. He's lost a zero off his net worth. And, and he doesn't have, you know, he doesn't have the leeway. He's, he's not a spring chicken anymore. So he screwed himself, but he's more importantly, he screwed us. So I'm going to vote against anything he has to do until he gets the company to profitability, which will make the stock go back up. All right. So that's, that's my take on that. All right. Final stock of the day before we're done. Um, TPCS. Um, I don't know if this is accurate because they haven't changed the ticker symbol. The ticker symbol has changed back to TPCS. They removed the D this morning. Okay, so if there are some abnormalities in your um, uh, on your screen, like mine, say the stock's up 256 percent today, it's not. You know, this morning it said that I was down because uh, the the price was uh, a dollar something. It's not. Uh, we're back to normal here, and it looks like my chart is probably normal as well. Yep, yep, the chart is normal. Okay, so we can count on the chart for how it is. And what I'm going to tell you about TPCS, right, is you've seen this move down in the stock out of disappointment that they didn't announce their uplisting. I still believe the uplisting is going to happen, right? And, and so this is just traders scaring, getting scared out of a stock. Um, and that's unfortunate because this is another one of those companies. There's your green lines and your white lines, okay? And you can see here. The big pullback that's taken place. Now, what I want to draw your attention to is, boom, right here, GHM. Okay, Graham Corporation's in the same space as TPCS, and here on this chart is the equivalent of where we were right here. Okay, so we got to this peak right here. That's this peak right here in TPCS. This is the gray lines TPCS, and you see this move down which is this move down right here that we've experienced, okay? What's happened in the meantime is Graham has moved up, okay? It's pulled back a little bit in recent days, probably because the market's pulled back and also giving back some of these juicy gains that it's had, okay? Very juicy gains. But the question is why has Graham moved up and TPCS has moved down? Well, let's start with the first question. Why has Graham moved up? For that, we look at the earnings call. And on earnings call, you could see that the 12 month, trailing 12-month 12 orders um, have a book-to-bell ratio of 114%. That's very bullish. Okay, it says a great representation of their growth in future potential, especially true given the large value of repeat orders we have received for critical U.S. Navy projects, which TPCS also does, which we believe validates our position as a key supplier, which TPCS is, and I should note that January orders, which came in after the end of Q4 for TPCS, January order rates have started out strong, which is encouraging. Further, our success with the U.S. Navy has resulted in very robust backlog of defense business, which TPCS also has experienced, while increasing our presence in the growing industry, space industry. In fact, I will dive a little bit deeper. Let's skip over this part and say, um, here we go. While orders in the quarter... Of 20 million were soft, just like TPCS. We believe it was primarily due to timing, which is what I've told you already about TPCS, and a reflection of the general ebb and flow of large projects being released. Normal ebbs and flows of large projects being released. So they announced soft orders for the quarter, but said it was normal, and said that the business was coming in January, and as a result, the stock responded the way it should. Fundamentally strong this was back here, they announced this, and it just kept going up. TPCS didn't. You know what that is called? That's called opportunity. Okay? TPCS did a poor job on their call explaining what Graham did a good job on their call explaining, and just because of words, TPCS went down instead of up, which it should have. It should continue to be strong on this. All right. Now, of course, it had already moved up, so okay, fine, maybe it just hung in there. But to crash like this, to me, makes no sense. I think this is a great opportunity for those who like to follow the methodology that I teach. If you missed out on buying RWM when I told you don't feed into CNBC's bullshit, 
If you listen to me, you made 16% in six weeks instead of losing 16% in six weeks. What I'm telling you now, same thing. You see the buy, the super mega buy, the transformative buy, the super mega buy. All these buys, 100% of the buys I've given you have led to profits. Maybe not immediately, but they've led to profits. Okay, And yes, there is some downside left before we hit the bottom of this line. That doesn't mean we're going to get there. What's more important is we're in the lower section where you want, if you don't already own this stock, you want to be getting long this stock. Okay? Because we have all this upside. Look at all that upside, juicy, juicy upside in a, resist, a, resist, a recession resistant, in fact, probably recession proof stock. Because in a recession, the government has to pick up the slack by spending more money. Okay? They print money in recessions, right? You all know this. What do they spend the money on? Government projects. Among the government projects, what TPCS does. So that makes TPCS not only recession resistant, but recession proof. Okay? And so that's that on them. Just wanted to show you that, um, that difference. That all it takes is words. But words is not what drives the actual value of a company, which eventually gets reflected in a stock. And Graham all-time highs on their announcement uh, not all-time high, 52 week highs on their announcement you can see it right here right if I zoom in boom this company's been going strong look at that chart that looks that's a chart that we that's the chart that we want to see on TPCS well that's easy because the TPCS chart can very easily be looking like that all it has to do is rebound from these levels okay Graham rebounded from its levels. TPCS should rebound from theirs because they are involved in the same kind of business. Let's go to Q&A and call it a day. Final questions of the day. Um, if I haven't answered your question, please put it back in the chat. I might have missed one or two because there were topics that you know I knew that I wanted to skip over. I don't want to go through all the questions again to find that one or two questions I didn't already ask. So please answer, ask the question again if I haven't answered it already and we're going to call it a day. Um, let's see. On Easy Money Portfolio, you have RWM, SH, TLT as short hedges. Does your methodology assume equal weight in each? Okay, so that's a great question. That's actually one of the best questions of the day. Easy Money Portfolio. Here is the Easy Money Portfolio. Okay, and you can find this, you know, just by clicking the link at the top, it's pinned to the top of this chat, okay? And you'll go into my presentation, and my presentation shows you how to find everything about me, okay? It's a nice big presentation for you to go through, all right? All for free, as always, all right? But what we have here is, there's what he's talking about, RWM, SHTLT. Let me pull it down so it's, all right? And for the most part, you know, you can be 33% in each of those, all right, you see some here using a combination of these. All right, so I did put a notation here for you that says using a combination of these, see the tracker tab for the trades slash current mix. So you go to tracker tab here, and what you'll find is the last time that I bought, so I added some Smith Micro at a dollar. Let me put this above my head so you can see it. Okay, so just recently. I added Smith Micro on the 20th of March. It was 98 cents. It actually went up 20% quickly off of that level, so you could have made a quick trade off of that if you wanted to, okay, using the white lines as a guide, but we're still up 2%, right? The market, of course, is down pretty significantly um, over the last several days, so beautiful. But what I did this time, and instead of what I've typically been doing is buying RWM, you see, we bought PESI. Okay, on March 10th, we bought PESI, and we see PESI's up 33% since that time. But to protect our PESI position, we also bought RWM, and RWM is also up 1% at this time. We got paid on our insurance policy. We're making money on our insurance policy, even though we're not taking a loss. It's beautiful. That's how you really do it. And what we did in this case with SMSI is I decided this time, instead of using RWM as a hedge, I decided to use TLT. That's the 20-plus-year Treasury Bond ETF. 
The reason I did this is that bonds go up in value when interest rates go down. Now, yes, the Fed is saying they're going to continue to raise interest rates. I think they're going to have to pivot. Gunlock thinks they're going to have to pivot. Okay? The legends say that interest rates are going to go down, not up. Because a recession is going to hit and they're going to be forced to lower interest rates. And if and when that happens, TLT will go up in value. And you can see TLT has had a very rough go of it. Look at this chart. The chart even broke. Okay, That's not supposed to happen with bonds. Bonds are not supposed to break like that, but they did. Okay, But bonds are bonds. Bonds go up over time. And I do believe we're going to see this move back into the channel eventually. And so that's going to be a profit situation for those who hold TLT. In my opinion, I think TLT is going to be profitable. But it, in the meantime, it's just an insurance policy against our longs. I don't want to be long right now because I think the market's going to tank. But I have to be long companies like SMSI and PESI because they provide such great upside potential. And you could see what happened, right? Despite being concerned about the market, buying into PESI on March 10th was a 33% profitable position for us to take. And our insurance policy allowed us to do that and not worry about the market crashing. Okay, Even though it still worked out either way. We didn't even need the insurance policy in this case. But if the market did weigh PESI down, the insurance policies would have taken care of that. I hope that answers your question. Um, we see no more questions in the queue. It is 3.50. I'd love the last not three nine minutes of the day to check out my portfolio. By the way, I don't look at the market all day. I don't I don't even know if I really looked at the market today. I was very busy putting this uh, information together for you. I hope you enjoyed it. If you're new, subscribe. Um, we already hit 2,000 subscribers, so I don't care if you hit subscribe or not. We already hit 100,000 views, so I don't care if you view or not. All right? I was kind of curious. I, I was... I liked, I, I liked the idea of getting to 2,000. It's a nice round number. It's a milestone. So um, I really appreciate those of you who got us to 2,000 subscribers. But now 3,000 is a long way away. So I don't care if you hit the subscribe button or not. But if you want to check this out every week, hit that subscribe button. Check out what I'm doing. It'll introduce you to the WhatsApp rooms. It'll introduce you to the stock twits rooms, the Twitter account, my blog site, so you can get these articles, so you can get these picks. You can see we put Pessy in there, right? Um, and, and make money. Start making this kind of 36% gains, right? Um, which very close, $10,000 at 40% a year, 14 years, makes you a millionaire. Think about it. 10000 becomes a million at 40% per year. In 14 years and we've done 36 percent um, since 2014 for free on your behalf and that's just this portfolio which is not a trading does not use a lot of these um, risk reward principles that I, I teach you about okay I'll come on here and you're gonna be able to make those trades without this here because I only put a few trades you could see last year the last several trades very profitable right but March 2022, this is over a year ago, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight trades in one year. Only eight trades in one year, less than one a month. But when I come on here, I give you ideas and you see the charts and you can make extra money on these picks by strategically moving in and out of them based on the risk reward charts that you see on your screen. I'm not going to give you those picks. I'm not a trader. I don't want to teach trading, but you can make a lot of extra money on that, which gets you to that million a little bit quicker. But make sure you follow the rules, of course. But then you see here, boom, beautiful gains. In fact, wow, I didn't even realize we're four for the last four. The market's been getting crushed. And our last four picks all up, 24, 47, 63, and 33%. Those are big gains for those of you who've been following the rules and trusting in the work that I've done for the last 30 years. Uh, and for that, you applaud yourself. Don't applaud me. I'm just here to give back what other people gave to me. I'm just teaching what I was taught. I didn't invent this stuff. I was taught this. The only credit I give myself is actually going out and watching the videos, learning the lessons, and executing them. Okay? So go out, learn the lessons, watch the videos, and execute them. I'll catch you next time. Take care. Um, is there a PESI WhatsApp room? Um, go to Breakout Investors.
Okay, app.breakoutinvestors.com. There's a lot of discussion about PESI in those rooms. Um, also in my WhatsApp rooms, which I did display um, in uh, this slide right here, how to get to my WhatsApp rooms. Okay, so the pinned message at the top, right? The pinned message at the top of the live chat. Uh, you can click on that. That'll get you to this presentation that you see on your screen. You can go to this slide, click on the link. You can join my WhatsApp rooms, and you will be you'll be introduced. You know, Aaron's there. Um, you know, he talks about Pessy there in, in some of those rooms. We also forward some of the message from the breakout uh, WhatsApp room, so you'll be able to find the breakout WhatsApp room by getting to one of my rooms and just asking somebody the link to the WhatsApp room, and you can get there there. Okay, so I hope that helps out. All right, that's it. Have a great weekend. Well, oh, by the way, I probably won't be here next week. I'm going to take a week and, and go off to Mexico with my lovely wife, Julieta, over there, a little smile on her face. Yes, we're going to Mexico, baby. Um, look at you. Uh, and uh, so we probably won't. I'll probably do a very short video next week just to let you guys know that there won't be a video next week for those of you who tune in every week on Friday at 2. I'm uh, just going to take a little week off. Hope you don't mind. We'll catch you next week. Take care.